Hutton, ho! When I was in basic training in Alert Academy, every morning at some unknown, godforsaken hour, the drill instructor and my senior drill sergeant would shout out, Hutton, ho! Attention! Everybody stand at attention by your racks. Like, Ugh. we had to be ready at any moment for whatever the day might bring. Ready for whatever might come. We had to have all our belongings in exactly the right place, or that we'd have be, be screamed at more and more push-ups and more flutter kicks and more thrashing, as they called it. We had to be at attention at a moment's notice, ready, ready for what the day would bring. And you and I are faced every day with attacks, with a war. We are faced with, by our enemy, Satan, with a war on our, on our souls, a war against our marriages, a war against family, a war against our hearts, a war against the church. <laughs> and temptations come through a lot of different ways, through division, dissension, discord, through discouragement, depression, and doubt, through temptation of lust, profanity, addiction, all kinds of tactics the stra- that, and strategies that the enemy uses. Why? Because when we step forward to put our faith in Jesus Christ and we're brought into the family of God, into the ranks of the Captain Christ, the enemy, he envisions a big red target on all of our backs, just like that. Right? And at the center of the target is you and me. Right? I don't get a pass. We're all faced with a war. A war against truth. A war against our souls. A war against marriages. A war against our families. A war against God's people. And the strategies, the fiery flaming arrows of the enemy come in all kinds of ways waging war against our soul. The problem is you and I often don't know what kind of weapons or armor God has equipped us with. We might be able to recite parts of Ephesians chapter 6. Maybe I know the armor of God. I remember seeing that in Sunday school when I was a kid. But how does it actually work in a daily life? How does the armor of God, or the weapons that God provides, the strength that God provides, how do we lean into that? How do we utilize what God has given us for the war? Because there is a target on your back, and Satan is at war against your soul. And he wants to take us out. He wants to take me out. He wants to take you out. That's why there's a target on your back. And so the question that we talked about last week, same question for this Sunday as we gather is, what does God provide his people for the daily battle? Because we're all in this battle, and we can't enter the battleground as if it's a playground. We can't show up with flip-flops and Bermuda shorts on. We're in a battle against our souls, against our marriages, against our families, against the church. And our battle is not against people or people groups or political parties, but our ultimate battle is against Satan, sin, and his system. And so we've been spending some time now in Ephesians chapter 6, and I want you to turn with me there to Ephesians chapter 6. Last week we looked at we have to stand strong in the strength that God provides, not our own strength, not what we think we have in ourselves, in our intellect, or our experience, or our own maturity, but we stand strong in the strength that God provides to stand firm against the assaults and the attacks of the enemy that come in all kinds of angles. And we also have to prepare our minds for war. We have to be on the alert, focused, at attention, all the time, because we're at war. We're on a battleground, not a playground. And we have to guard against Satan's lies with God's weapons. The main tactic that our enemy uses to get into our minds and wage war against our souls and bring destruction and devastation in marriages and families and churches is through lies. Lies. Because he's the father of lies. He's the deceiver. He's the accuser of the brethren. And he accuses the brethren with lies. And so we guard against Satan's lies with God's weapons. Well, what weapons are those? We looked at truth and righteousness last Sunday. Truth and righteousness. But today, I want us to enter into the third through fifth pieces of the armor. And so in Ephesians chapter 6, 
verses 10 through 20. I want us to stand first, and we're going to recap where we've been, starting in verse 10. Stand at attention, right? Focused and alert. All right, here we go. Ephesians chapter 6, we're standing in reverence to give attention to God's holy, unchanging, infallible, inspired word. Finally, because of everything that has gone before in this message, Paul writes, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the full armor of God so that you'll be able to stand, resist in the evil day and having done everything, to stand firm. Stand firm. Therefore, having girded your loins with truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, in addition to all, take up the shield of faith with which you will be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation. You may be seated. And so, We're going to see three more weapons, but three ways in which we stand firm. Stand ready for battle. How do you and I stand ready for battle against temptation, against doubt, against discouragement, against disillusionment, against despair, against dissension, against disputes, against all kinds of ways that Satan, our enemy, uses strategies to try to tear us down He tries to kill, steal, and destroy. How do we stand ready for battle? And the first way here in this next set is that we stand ready for battle. Why? How? By marching with peace. That's where we are. Marching forward with peace. And so you saw on the line just now, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace put on these sandals. Well, again, the Apostle Paul was chained to a Roman guard. He was around all kinds of various Roman soldiers at this time. Some of them may not have been in full battle array, but he would have been familiar with what they were wearing to battle, wearing as Roman soldiers, and everybody reading this letter from the Apostle Paul would have been familiar with that. And so when Roman soldiers prepared for marching, they had to wear shoes. They couldn't go barefoot. And so they had these special sandals, but they'd also have a leather wound around their leg and uh, possibly some thick leather to guard their shins. And if it was cold, they'd stuff wool or fur in there to keep their feet warm. And he's saying the way, one way by which you stand ready for battle is by preparing. But how do you prepare for this is by, sh- by your feet being ready to walk, to move forward with what God has provided in the gospel of peace. And in the church in Ephesus, they were dealing with divisions. They were dealing with an ethnic division that they were coming to grips with the the reality of their unity in Jesus, but they faced a division which Paul talked about in Ephesians chapter 2. He said, we're going to look at this in a moment, that that there was Jew and there were were, uh, Gentile groups in the church, but they're being made one in Jesus Christ. And there were other divides, socioeconomic divides in the first century. And so they were familiar with these divisions, these dissensions in the culture. And one thing we know is that the fault lines of the culture often invade the church. And so today, we think about what's going on in our culture, in the divides, in the disputes. We live in a world longing for peace and yet scrambling for it and finding none of it. Just to jog your memory, these are a few pictures from the news over the last months and years. There's another, you know, pictures of riots and so on, There's, and another one, and then just a third picture, a recent picture from Ukraine. War, protests, riots, anger, vitriol, violence, not only on the streets but in homes, breaking apart communities, breaking apart nations. 
And yet the good news of Jesus is the good news of peace. How is that possible? How, can, how could the first century believers in Ephesus live in a culture that was just as broken and divided as ours as people of peace? How is that possible and how is it possible for us? I want you to zoom in on this word that last week we talked about two other Greek words, aletheia, which means truth, and dikaiosune, which means righteousness, and this word peace in the Greek is eirene. So I want you to turn a couple pages over in Ephesians 2, Ephesians chapter 2, which talks about the great divide and then what Jesus Christ has done. So verses 13 to 17 is what we're going to look at here, and you're going to see this word peace repeat four times in these verses. But now in Christ Jesus, well, what do you mean, but now? Well, look back at verse 12. Remember that you were at that time separate from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. There was a division, right? But now in Christ Jesus, verse 13, you who formerly were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. He's talking about a vertical reconciliation, In the cross of Jesus Christ, you and I are reconciled to God. We have peace with God, how? By the blood of Christ's cross. This is why the apostle said, apostle Paul said in the 1 Corinthians chapter 1, chapter 2, why is there a division among you? Some of you say Apollos, some of you say Paul, some of you say Christ. Is Christ divided? And the answer to that is no. Why? I came to you preaching Christ and him crucified. Why? Because Christ on his cross tears down all the walls that the culture creates. <laughs> right? And so he's writing again to the believers in Ephesus and he says, you were far off, now you're near. You're in right relationship with God by the cross of Christ for he himself is our peace. Jesus Christ is the Prince of Peace. He is our peace who made both groups into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall by abolishing in his flesh the enmity that is the hostility, which is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so that in himself he might make the two into one new man, thus establishing peace. If there was ever a greater ethnic, social, and religious divide, it was that between Jew and Gentile. And we think of the various divides in our culture. This would have been at the top. They didn't speak to each other, didn't enter each other's homes, they didn't worship together, they didn't touch each other, they didn't eat off the same table. None of that, right? And Jesus Christ, who is our peace, he died so that we could be one in him. And so when we prepare to go against our enemy, stand ready for battle, we're prepared by the peace that Jesus Christ gives us in himself. Everything changes. Everything changes. He said there's a dividing wall. What's that dividing wall? Well, there was a literal wall around a temple court where the Gentiles could not pass, and there was a sign on this wall in the temple court, if you pass, you will die. The Gentiles could not worship with Jews in the temple courts. There was no mixture, right? Once they entered in that space, they could not cross Jesus Christ broke down that figurative or literal wall, and he also broke down the metaphorical wall, that we were separate because of our our sin, right? That kind of wall. We had spiritual separation from God, but Jesus Christ reconciled us to God. The word reconciliation is synonymous with peace in Ephesians. And so he continues, thus establishing peace, verse 16, and might reconcile them both in one body to God, through the cross, by it having put to death the enmity. And he came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near, both Gentile and Jew, now one. For through him we both have our access in one spirit to the Father. How many? One. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who's above all and through all and in all of you, is how the Apostle Paul puts it in Ephesians chapter 4. So then... You are no longer strangers and aliens, but are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household. This is revolutionary language. Now, the Apostle Paul is not inciting a civil insurrection. He's lifting up the true entity of what it means to be the church, that we're not like the culture that's broken and divided and hateful and angry and violent 
and splitting apart. 21st century, 1st century. We're not like that because the cross of Christ tears down the divides. You've heard me say this before, but I believe that Martin Luther King Jr.'s dream is God's design for his church. You get that? That the young and the old, the rich and the poor, the black and the white, and every other kind of ethnic group can be one in Jesus Christ. It can't happen without Jesus. You see, God's design for his church is in the gospel of Jesus Christ, who is our peace. The lie that Satan wants to get into your minds and in your hearts right now is that you can't be united to that person who offended you. You can't, you should not forgive that person who maligned you or slandered you. Or you should not be brother or sister or united in worship to that person who's not like you. That's a lie. And when that lie comes into your ears and may, might even try to sink down into your heart, what are we to say? We combat Satan's lies with God's truth. That's the way we wage war. We stand firm in the gospel, which is peace. The gospel has brought peace vertically reconciling us to God and peace horizontally reconciling us to one another, both Jew and Gentile, sinner and sinner. Turn with me over to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 3. I want you to see one more passage as we think of that word, a reine, peace. It says, being diligent to preserve the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. And there is one body and one spirit. And so we're to work out this unity diligently because the spirit who indwells us, who regenerated us by the gospel of Jesus Christ to a new life is the one who brings peace in the church. And so every language and tribe and tongue and nation is to be one around the throne, around the throne of the Lamb of God, and we are to live the way heaven will be here on earth. We can live that way. Is that radically countercultural? It is. Yeah. Because our culture wants us to be angry with each other about everything. You turn on cable news networks and their veins are popping out of their necks. Ah! Everybody be upset and angry. Everybody hate everybody. Let's scream and punch and whatever. We stand ready for battle by marching with peace. That's point number one. Marching with peace, which is more than just being a peaceful person in your soul, in our tranquility, but functioning in, working diligently to preserve the unity of the spirit. Why? Because there's one spirit in the bond of peace. We're bonded together by the cross. We have rich and poor. We have black and white. We have different ethnic and educational backgrounds and all of that. We are bonded together by Christ. Yes? Do you agree with that? Yeah. And this is how we stand ready for battle, marching with peace. You know, when I've played on various sports teams, some of you served in the military, the parallel is pretty clean. When you have a unit of soldiers, when you have a football team, when you have a hockey team, you have various differences and you have various skills across the board different sizes, men or women on the team or in the unit. All of those things function together for the good of the team. They don't divide the team. And this is how it's supposed to be in the church. Because you're bonded together by the cross of Jesus Christ. Vertical reconciliation leads to horizontal reconciliation, which is totally countercultural to the destruction that Satan wants to bring about in our culture or in the church. And we can live this way, May, for a Bible church. We can, by the gospel of God. We're prepared to march forward. And so, he says, and back to Ephesians chapter 6, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, you can move forward. I want you to look at one more passage here, Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 through 15. It says, so as those who've been chosen of God, have you been chosen of God? God chose you, you didn't choose him, ultimately, he chose you. Holy and beloved, some of you may not feel holy right now, some of you may not feel beloved right now, but guess what, that's what God calls you. So we learn to be what we are in Jesus Christ. Put on 
And this word is found in Ephesians 6. Put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Why? Because that's the way that God has responded to you, poured out his loving kindness on you, forgiven you all of your sin debt. Oh, is God patient with you, so you should be patient with your brother or your sister and your neighbor. And then bearing with one another and forgiving each other, whoever has a complaint against you, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. Sometimes I wish in my sinful flesh that it said, sometimes like as the Lord forgave you. But in the Greek, it means just as, like as, according to, exactly as. Just as God has forgiven you, how much? <laughs> Everything. So you forgive those who offend you. Everything. Next verse Beyond all these things put on, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. And the result of that is let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you are called in one body and be thankful. That the natural outflow of that forgiveness, compassion, patience, kindness rooted in the reality that you are chosen and beloved in God, that love brings about peace It'll rule in your hearts when you're tempted to believe Satan's lies, when that person doesn't look at you the right way or speaks some way that you don't like or maybe gossips about you or slanders you or maybe says something just awful about you and you want to dig in and fight against them. We have to remember, no, our battle is not against people. It's against Satan's sin and his system and the lie that the enemy wants to get us to believe is that we should not forgive them, or we should hold them in debt, and we'll somehow be better for it if we do hold them in debt. Instead, the grip of the grudge is like poison in our souls. Instead of it killing them, it kills us inside. And so we got to let it, let that drop, forgive, and show patience and compassion. This is how followers of Jesus march forward with peace. Why? Because we have a mission. And we have an enemy. We have to be ready. Stand ready for battle by marching with peace. And the next phrase, in addition to all. Another way to translate that is above all. Well, this is the first piece of armor that you wouldn't physically be wearing. In addition to all taking up the shield of faith with which you will be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. This shield is the word for a large body-sized shield, okay? It was maybe four or five feet tall and was two layers of wood glued together and then they had fabric around it, leather around it, and then around the edges in the center, metal nailed onto this thing. And then they would, before battle, they would dip it into water so that it was damp, so that when arrows came shooting at the shield, they'd be extinguished or glance off, and if those stuck in, they'd be extinguished by the damp leather and cloth surrounding this shield. I want you to get a picture of what this shield looked like. That's a pretty good representation of it. And so you see one guy guarding, right? It's supposed to cover all the armor, the shield of faith, Faith is resolute trust and confidence in who God is, even when you don't know or understand what God is doing. It's when the enemy wants to take you out by unbelief. And by unbelief are those subtle lures of doubt, skepticism, unbelief that leads to a change in behavior because you're moving into his way of lies. But instead, you guard, you guard against those flaming arrows why? By saying, no, I'm going to trust in God and let every man be a liar. I'm going to trust in God and I'm not going to believe the father of lies. I'm going to trust in God no matter what happens. I'm going to confidently trust in him because I know who he is and I will stand in what I know is true about him even when I don't understand maybe why I'm going through this trial or maybe why this happened to me. I will not believe the lie. I will not cave to the enemy's assaults. But it gets even better than this. Because it's not just you in this battle. Dare we think that this is an individual thing? We're here together, right? And the Roman guard would build in what's called a testudo formation or a tortoise formation. This is how they marched forward in battle. This is how they guarded against arrows and spears 
to be thrown at them. And the way that the Apostle Paul is saying you're going to take up the shield of faith is not just you by yourself, but is with every other follower of Jesus within the assembly of the church that you're standing with, which means you're not alone, you're not isolated in these temptations or these assaults or these battles. We're in this together and we're guarding each other, not just ourselves with faith. So when somebody is discouraged and they fall into doubt or they fall into the, this vortex of, I'm not sure if I really believe God for what he's saying here, you lift them up. You say, wait a minute. No, you don't. God has walked you through this in the past. God has led you through this. He is with you. Let's go back to his word. We can trust in him. We're going to shield together. How many of you need that this morning? <laughs> like, I can't do this alone. You don't have to. You don't have to. Maybe tell somebody next to you, you know what? I need your shield. Yeah, I'm holding my own. It's really heavy. <laughs> I need you. I need yours. I got something coming from the side. See those shields on, even on the side there? I can't guard that. I know somebody's right there. That's why we're in this together, guarding against Satan's lies with God's weapons. So he says, shield of faith. We have a target on our back. I think about those arrows. I brought an extinguisher. Some of you are wondering if I'm going to spray this at Robert if he misbehaves. But so to extinguish the flaming arrows, or your translation might say fiery darts of the enemy, of the evil one who wants to kill, steal, and destroy you with his lies because that's what he's been doing from the very beginning in the Garden of Eden. To put them out, Notice that it says all, and in all my work in studying New Testament Greek, all still means all. It doesn't mean some. Sometimes I've believed it's only some. Like, ah, no, that one got me. No, oh, that one got me. Oh, man. What are these flaming arrows that come at us in all kinds of ways? Some that I just dealt with this week, in case you're interested. Can I have my own personal confession time in front of all of you? Anger. I'm not going to say at who. Envy. And impatience. That's just a few of the fiery darts that I dealt with. The thing about fiery darts, arrows, is that if they stick, they sink in and they're hard to get out. You might be dealing with lust, greed, envy, confusion, pride, shame, guilt, Anger, addiction, unforgiveness, hopelessness, anxiety, fear, depression, discouragement, doubts, defeat, and you can list off more, I'm sure. These are ways in which the evil one wants to tear you down. And the way you guard against Satan's lies is with God's truth, and you believe in the truth by faith. You say, no. I, I don't have to take that step to look at that image or to watch that as if I'm not satisfied with my marriage or I'm not satisfied in the place that God has given to me. I don't have to look at that. Why? Because Satan's lie is that I'll be satisfied or be happy if I respond to that sensual image. That's a lie, right? Because God has given me satisfaction for life and joy and purpose in Christ. I don't need that. I don't need to be personally discouraged right now about all the things that are weighing down on me. Why? Because I know that I have eternal hope in heaven. I know that even through the pain and the process of my current situation, God is working out an endurance and a patience of soul that will bring about maturity in Jesus Christ. So I'm going to keep walking forward. Or maybe for you it is guilt and shame. You've done some unspeakable sin. Nobody knows about it but you and God, and it weighs over you every day. You wake up, and you look in the mirror, and you see that shame. You see that guilt, and Satan wants to go, man, you're a, you're, you're a mess up. You're a lie. You're a fraud. Everybody at church doesn't know, but I know, and he starts accusing you, and the truth that you wage war against with that lie, you say, no, I know that Jesus Christ has forgiven me, erased all my sin debt. When he looks at me, he calls me holy and beloved and chosen. That's what you can say to your soul when you're, when you're facing the attacks of the enemy. Maybe your marriage is on the rocks. 
and you're like, man, I deserve better than this. Somebody else, I can marry some other, some other person and I'll be happier, wealthier, and more fulfilled. God has a purpose for your marriage. It's to make you more like Jesus. God wants to make you more like Jesus, which means the way to marriage is the way to the cross, which is the way of sacrifice and humility and compassion and mercy and patience. And you're to lean into that with Christ in view and say, I believe that God brought me into this and that God is doing a sanctifying work in my heart, in my life, in my marriage, and I will not run off to believe Satan's lies. Right? Maybe some of you are facing this, this constant temptation to sink into drugs or alcohol because you believe that's a good escape. And on a Friday night, you get your paycheck, and you're like, all right, it's time to escape my problems and the exhaustion of the work week. And the little lie comes in your ear and sinks down into your head. And you've believed it a hundred times, a thousand times, 50,000 times. And you know that on Monday morning, it's going to be back in the garbage can. But you go through the same cycle again. You don't have to. Why? You believe God's truth. You stand ready for battle by shielding with faith. I believe God is true. I believe that joy and peace and a sound mind is in Jesus, is in God's word, is in fellowship with God's people, as in serving others instead of seeking something for my sinful flesh. All kinds of ways that this works out. There's doubts or defeat. And so we shield with faith. Maybe some of you are saying, you know what, Michael, you don't know why or what I'm dealing with. And maybe that's the truth. <laughs> but God does. And what God invites you to is what the psalmist talked about in chapter 23. And David wrote, you lead me beside still waters. You restore my soul. You lead me in paths of righteousness for his namesake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. You don't have to be afraid of Satan's lies. Why? Because you're standing ready for battle with the shield of faith, which is available in Jesus Christ. Third one, so we march with peace, we shield with faith. And then he continues this way, and take the helmet of salvation, take up. And it's not put on, it's a different word for take up. And it's most likely used there because Paul's envisioning that one of the last things the soldier's going to use when he sees the enemy approaching, right? Because you're alert, because you're focused, because you know you're in a war, because you know there's an enemy. You have to be ready for battle, all right? And so you see the enemy approaching, and one of the last things you're going to do is put on the helmet. Why? Because helmets, especially in the first century, but battle armor today is hot and heavy and sweaty from what I'm told as well. And so the last thing you do, you put on, or second to last thing, you put on your helmet. Put on your helmet. Circumference around the head is how it's translated in Greek. Guards your mind, guards your head. You're going to put on this helmet of salvation when you see the enemy coming. I want us to take a look at Isaiah 59, 17 again, and 15 and 16, because what I talked about last week is that ultimately putting on the armor is putting on Christ. And so it says this, Now the Lord, Yahweh, saw, and it was displeasing in his sight that there was no justice. And he saw that there was no man and was astonished that there was no one to intercede. And then his own arm brought salvation to him and his righteousness upheld him. Next line. And he put on righteousness like a breastplate and a helmet of salvation on his head. And he put on garments of vengeance, that is battle armor, for clothing and wrapped himself with zeal as a mantle. Now I want us to look at the last verse in that chapter, verse 20. A redeemer will come to Zion and to those who turn from transgressions in Jacob, declares the Lord. 
And this is talking about ultimately the end of Christ. When Christ returns to establish his glorious kingdom on earth, there is a redeemer in Zion, and he fights the battle we cannot fight. He won the fight. He won the war we could not win so that we could receive the righteousness of God in him. Salvation, simply put, is this. It is God's work of grace in freeing us from sin and granting us new and eternal life in him. It is received freely as a gift of God, mercy, not of our own works, lest any man should boast. God's gift of grace to free us from sin, that is in three parts. You are saved, past tense, from the penalty of sin when you put your trust in Jesus Christ. You are saved, past tense, right? You're justified, declared right in God's sight, clothed with the righteousness of Christ. You're a saint, God calls you. Nowhere do you find the epistles start off in the New Testament with, hello, sinners. It says, hello, saints. Why? Because positionally, you are declared righteous, not by your own works, but by the mercy, the compassion, the overflowing grace of God in whom, in Jesus Christ, through the cross, who has made you one in Jesus. And so you are reconciled to God you have peace with God through the blood of the cross. You're saved past tense. So that's the past tense part of salvation. But there's the present tense. You're saved, being saved from the power of sin. In Romans chapter 6, you're no longer on the, under the domination, under the old man, under the mastery of sin any longer. Why? Because you're indwelled by the Holy Spirit. You've, been, you've died with Christ, been raised to Christ. You have a new heart and a new life. And so you are walking in the power of this new life, the resurrection life right now. So you are being freed from sin. But then there's a third stage, which is the stage we're all looking forward to, the glorious stage of our resurrection, the resurrection of the righteous, Christ coming in his eternal kingdom established on the earth, and that is when we are saved from the presence of sin. We will be saved from the presence of sin. No longer will we face temptation and insidious strategies of Satan. No longer will we face illness, the effects of sin and the fall. No longer will we face death. No longer will we have tears, for Jesus Christ will wipe them away, and we will see the new heavens and the new earth, and we'll, he will rejoice. And so, when Jesus is talked about in Isaiah chapter 59, he has taken on the helmet of salvation. Why? Because salvation is in himself. Righteousness is in him. And he will bring perfect justice to the earth. And he will establish his kingdom on earth. A redeemer will come to Zion. But we know this redeemer now. We know this redeemer lives. And we can live right now in his present future kingdom. So our faith is in future grace, as one pastor put it. We live it now, we experience the redemption, the forgiveness of sin, but we know there is a day coming when our Redeemer comes, and he will ride a white horse with a robe dipped in blood, and he will vanquish all of his enemies, all of our enemies will be gone. Right? Are you looking forward to that day? And so we live by faith right now in the future grace which we will experience at his coming, the helmet of salvation. And so the lies of the enemy, you don't deserve redemption, you've sinned too much, you'll never get this right, take up, you see those lies coming, you see the enemy coming, approach, you put on the helmet of salvation, no, my Jesus lives, my Redeemer lives, he's coming again like Robert said a couple weeks ago in our men's group, he said, you know, when the enemy comes with his lies, when Satan and his demons come with their lies, I remind them of their future. <laughs> no more, no more. Stand ready for battle. Are you alert? Are you focused? Stand ready for battle. Are you stand ready for battle by marching with peace the peace that is in Jesus Christ by shielding with faith and guarding with salvation. The salvation that is past, present, and future by grace through faith in Christ alone. This is the way to stand ready for battle. And so, there's a 
another little component to you know, standing at attention, you know, getting ready for battle. A friend of mine named Dennis was in the Marines for about 12 years, and they say once a Marine, always a Marine. So he and I were having a conversation about boot camp and all those lovely things like Hell Week and stuff, you know. So he, uh, he told me about how they were trained with the, M- with the M16. It's a rifle, it's a weapon, it's not a gun. You can ask him later, or Marine, you know. Trained to use that weapon, you're trained to use a K-bar knife, exactly. They want it to become almost like an appendage on your body because you learn to assemble and disassemble, assemble and disassemble, clean, and, and so it becomes like second nature all the time, right? But there's more than that. He told me that when in the field, you never put it down. It's always within reach. If you're sleeping, it's there. You know exactly where it is. It's always right there. So it is with God's weapons that he's provided for us to guard against Satan's lies. It's near. It's in your hand. The word of God. The truth of Jesus Christ. Do you know it like the back of your hand? Do I know it like the back of our hand? We have to be ready. Stand ready for battle. First thing you think about when you wake up in the morning, the last thing you think about when you go to bed at night, what's on your mind, what's on your heart? Our lives have to be under God's word, under the truth through which we receive righteousness, through which we know we can, by God's good news, march forward with peace, through which we understand how to walk by faith, to be shielded with faith, to guard with the knowledge of our salvation. So let's close our eyes for a moment and think about your own situation in your heart. In a moment, we're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper, communion, bread, and the fruit of the vine to think of his sacrifice, the cross through which we are reconciled, brought to peace with God, peace with one another. Maybe for you, so think about those lies that Satan is using in your head. He wants you to be divided, unforgiving, or bitter. Maybe filled with fear, guilt, shame. Maybe discouraged, doubtful, depressed, lustful, sensual, envious, profane, greedy. Maybe you faced a war battling in your soul, in your marriage, in your family. Maybe you're headed for divorce and there's nothing you can do about it. And you're really discouraged by that. Maybe your your adult child has gone off the deep end and making a shipwreck of their lives and there's nothing you can do about that. But the enemy, the accuser is in your head trying to take you out with discouragement and doubt and despair. When that comes... Even maybe right now for some of you, know the truth of who you are in God, what he calls you, and who he is even when you don't understand what he's doing. God calls you beloved, chosen. the apple of his eye, cherished, his redeemed, in Jesus Christ. And so take your, take your burdens to him, knowing he fought the fight you couldn't fight, won the battle you could not win so that you could be declared and walk in the righteousness of God through him. Father, we rejoice in who you are. By your grace, we stand in your presence. By your mercy, we stand in awe of forgiveness, of peace, 
where there was once hostility and enmity, there is peace. There are times in our lives we shake our fists in your face, yet you have given us peace to be in right relationship with you. There are times when we shake our fists in the face of our brother, our sister, other members of the family of God, and yet you call us to peace. There are times when we just cave into doubt or lust, envy, greed, and anger, impatience, the list goes on. Lord, I pray, we pray that as we put on the Lord Jesus Christ, we'd make no provision for the flesh in regard to its lusts or cave to the lies, but walk forward with grace and in your power, even though we as lambs, may we roar like a lion because we follow the Lion of Judah, our Savior, who's given us the weapons for the war. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.